Thank you so much for being here tonight, Carlos Mesa and Tony Cyprian, uh, two members of Marin Shakespeare Company's Return Citizens Theater Troupe, amazing performers and human beings. Tonight, I wanted to start with a land acknowledgement. I am zooming to you tonight from the home of the Coast Miwok people, people who lived here on this land for over 10,000 years. They, they were the first people to learn about this land, to love this land and to care for this land. And I think about them a lot, especially today, as um, I and we all see the effects of global warming and how um, the population today, a growing population on this small planet, uh, does not yet know how to take care of the land. And I hope that the Coast Miwok and, and other indigenous people um, will, will be able to be a resource for all of us to learn so that we can all have a better future for our, our children and grandchildren and generations to come. I wanna just start with that thought today. Tonight, what we're going to share with you is a video that we made um, called Creative Writing from Inside. During the pandemic, Marin Shakespeare Company had programs uh, in 14 California state prisons, 21 different programs, um, 21 different groups that were meeting weekly. And all of a sudden in March of 2020, those programs shut down. So we started doing a number of different um, alternative programming. We sent in videos and we sent in what we called um, packets, learning packets. And those, those, um, those instructional materials were invitations to people who were incarcerated, who were in our groups to continue the work that we do in our in-person groups of self-reflection, self-expression, and creativity, but it had to be done through writing because we couldn't be in person. We collected a large number of beautiful um, poems and letters and stories, and we created a section on our website called Creative Writing from Inside. And then we worked with some of the amazing artists who are now outside to create a performance of some of those writings. And that is what we're going to share with you tonight. It's a 28 minute video. You'll see both Carlos and Tony performing in it. And when we're done sharing this video, um, we're gonna turn it over to a conversation and ask for your reflections and questions. I miss my ladies of Shakespeare so dear. The fate of this world interrupts the plans we had to make. The state of this world could induce some tears, but I believe we bend and not break. Racist comments and chatter whisper loud. White silence equals violence. The sign read, is it love or COVID that spreads amongst the crowd? When black men are killed, the wolves then get fed. It's hard to describe these feelings inside. Frustration, disrespect, apathy. George Floyd's death could be the turning of the tides. Cruel intentions turned into a masterpiece. When the smoke clears, I'll see you again. The world just confirmed why we became friends. Corona, Corona, COVID-19. Corona, Corona, COVID-19. Corona, Corona, COVID-19. <laughs> what have you done? What have you done? What have you done? We all will. We all. 
Will we all will perish. Perish. Will perish. I'd always seen San Quentin crossing the San Rafael Bridge on my way to visit family in South Salido. I was scared for the people in there, frightened that I'd be thrown in there as a kid. The San Rafael Bridge is beautiful. The ocean underneath, the birds on a small island facing San Francisco. But once you get off, there's this ugly oil refinery. It's like a sore on a beautiful leg of flesh. Then you turn onto this winding road after the refinery. There it is, San Quentin. I got there early morning on the Alameda County bus. There were almost 40 of us. We were taken to R&R &R where there were cages and cages and benches and booths and windows. Each booth had a purpose, clothing, pictures, health, affiliate processing. By mid afternoon, we were put in cages outside so another county bus could be received and processed. Some guards came a few hours later to take us to South Block, Badger section. San Quentin blocks are five tiers with 50 cells on each tier. The noise level is unbelievable. I felt like crying. All the time passing it, San Quentin. I was finally in it. I was taken to a cell with no lights or windows on January 26, 2001. Night came quickly all by myself with no lights. I was able to cry myself to sleep. Hugs can disarm a cannon and like a cool breeze, can undo hatreds and racism or any foul disease. A hug can put a madman at ease. So hug as much and as deep as you please. Hug me today in your own special way. Instead of two aspirins, what two hugs do? We can hug this morning and create a new day. Our hearts warm and cozy where love goes. Wherever you drop, embrace each blade of grass. Wherever you drop, caress each beam of the sun. Where the sweet sand caresses toes of all the lasses. Where every hug unleashes the deepest fun. A group hug long and long will melt the ice and make everyone peaceful, warm, and nice. The brightest day is the birth of my son. He had the best parts of us that were great. Smile, electric, shining like the sun. I knew the greatness was in his fate. I knew the moment I seen him that I was blessed, hard beating fast. This feeling is love. Beautiful baby boy made from the best. Heart going so fast it could fly like a dove. Eyes bright like the moon at night. I prayed to heaven and to God above. Pulled through that birth. He had his mother's fight. Because God created you for me to love. Of all the DNA, he chose you from the rest because God knew I'd care and love you best. What type of black on black crime did you commit? Mine was robbery with two candles, use the Indian and unreserved violence, shots fired and just one black man left standing. The world's to be all black, like gambling, 
And what's funny is my own people won't be receptive to this end. And they say, oh, just another nigga around. Now, guilty was the verdict when the cops killed that unarmed boy, but he was black. Trust, it was just a one-day story. It's more important news to be televised while his mother endures pain, hurt, and lack of understanding why he telling his lies. Oh, I thought he had a weapon when he clearly had his hands up. He was reaching for a gun. He was just trying to pull his pants up. My people, we got to stand up. They killing our youth and getting paid leave, not to mention they concealing the truth. While you thinking better him than you, it could have been you, me, your son, sister, niece, nephew, or your brother. When will he be held accountable? It's time to form real unity within the black community. Cause black is beautiful. Stay strong, black people. I love you. COVID, you took us by surprise. All these deaths brings me to my knees. My faith, I criticize. Deep in my heart, I don't know what to believe. What if my parents die? Not being there for them puts me in guilt. So I lay down and cry. Then that sadness turns the rage that I built. Knowing death can hit me at any time. Meanwhile, cops killing George Floyd. Now, Trump saying protesting is a crime. Now, the police trying to avoid. COVID, you got me feeling lifeless. Not knowing about my parents. Got me feeling hopeless. All the world's in pandemic. And all the men and women are merely carriers. They have their infections and their maladies. And one virus in its time plays many parts. It's acts being seven victims. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in the mother's arms. <laughs> then, then the housebound schoolboy with his laptop and reary morning face, creeping oh. like snails unable to school. And then the roommates. Ranting like furnace with a woeful ballot played to his landlord's eyebrow. And a doctor full of Hippocratic oaths and mass like the crow, heroic in honor, sudden and quick in rescue, seeking the humble reputations <laughs> even in the vagrant mouth. And then the bureaucrat and fair round belly with good lobster lines with eyes shifty and hair piece of formal cut, full and wise ass in modern controversies. And so he plays his part. The sixth victim shifts to the suited and pantless pantaloon with spectacles on nose and webcam on side for his shrunk pay and his big manly voice turning again towards childish whispers, bills, and mortgage on his card. And last scene of all, that 
ends this strange viral history is second resurgence and mere oblivion. Mere oblivion. Sans breath. Sans breath. Sans breath. I sit here. I sit here in quarantine. In quarantine because of Corona 19 with no clue of what the hell that means. Minus the palm tree with the white island sand and the yum yum cakes with the bottle of Corona in her hand. Oh, man. Oh, man. Instead, I'm here in San Quentin isolation when I suddenly hear a sinister ovation. Unholy. Unholy and wicked is how it made me feel when the goosebumps of fear started to appear. And now I tremble. Looking into the mirror, what I resemble is a coward. He's a coward, he's emasculated. As I hear and see my own demons being congratulated. And it's crazy because I know these tools are mine. It's crazy because I know these tools are mine. I see them every day, thriving in prime time. I know them very well because these spirits are fell. And I've been slipping for a while now. I couldn't move as the ice of my bones made me freeze when, when a demon named Choosing Fees reminded me of every woman that I may pay a price of innocence lost that could not suffice my distorted vision. Another of my demons named Prison Bound turned around and his claw, his fist pounded. He looked my way and was astounded that their basic schemes of low expectations worked so well. Amazed that supposedly spiritual man couldn't escape his personal hell. Sitting all alone with no fantasies to tell. Of machismo, machismo, women, women, and wealth, and wealth. With no knowledge of the self, my rage is the virus after my health. With no knowledge of self, my rage is the virus after my health. Holding on to demons from the past will rob, kill, and destroy every positive force you'll use to employ. Clear focus. You'll hide behind the smoke from the hocus pocus of, of how hard it was being raised on your street. You know how we speak, where we from, every day is bleak. Busted dreams lost in broken concrete. These cracks, I never saw a flower. I never saw a flower. I never saw a flower. Why not now? Turn that rage into, into power. power. So I stared these demons in the eyes and I embraced them up close. Not from afar, not from a distance. They tried to escape, but in my rage, there was persistence. And my overstanding became an outside witness and I learned Men do cry. And I learned that men do cry when their identities descend from the sky. Demonic delusions breathe their last breath. All you'll need is what's left. All you need is what's left. Focus. First, Aubrey got popped, and now Floyd can't breathe. This white man full of hate want to destroy our seed. I got to fight to achieve, 
go to war for my belief in a world full of hatred, racism, and greed. In my time, I'm forced to survive COVID, depression, segregation, and oppression. Want a piece of the American dream? But that all died with the recession. This life thing, now that's one hell of a lesson. Some teach hate in a country where we're supposed to be great. We throw away about 30% of our plate when there's hunger in every state. I take eight shots for Brianna, nine minutes for the boy Floyd. Is that cop gonna shoot me because I'm black? Or is the boy just know it? They say MAGA loves blacks, but in reality, that's just dumb noise. I love Mexican women, but they want to kill my kind. For them, they put a wall up. If your ass ain't shooting the wind, then give the ball up. Iggers is what they call us, Ed bags, inks. A fucking owl he is. Y'all know the words that said. Why? Because my skin ain't white? Well, how could this be? In the home of the brave, in the land of the free. You won't ever get a job in Hollywood being an angry black man. Yeah, I know. You think Michael Mann would hire an angry black man? Or Francis Ford Coppola that did that Vietnam movie? We must play the game or starve. Bullshit. It's okay to be an angry white man, do whatever the fuck you want. Wait a minute. No, when a black man stands up, he's an angry brother. When a white man choke a brother out or shoots a brother in the back, shoot a young black man in the back, at his own grandmother's house. They are the they are not angry. Come here. When a white cop goes up to a black family in a car and shoots the black man to death in front of his girlfriend. When a white man executes a black man being held down at a bar station's floor. Who the fuck is angry? No. Don't even answer that. Your president is an angry, pale-faced white man. You'll never get a job in Hollywood. Do you have no respect for white folks? You are too angry. If angry means I don't get, I don't be kissing any white ass or you're right. There are enough bootlickers like you already, man. Scared to express yourself for fear of being called angry, which is the new N-word. This son of a bitch is beyond angry. <laughs> He's mad and will never work in Hollywood. I hope there are no cameras around. I, I bet he thinks that cameras up to watch black folks and people of color and to keep them in their hood. An invisible wall, as high as the one angry white man wants to build to keep natives and nature out of their own land. Fuck Hollywood. Yeah, I said, fuck Hollywood. We better get away from this guy before they think we with him. <laughs> we do know him. We grew up with him until he went away in the military and saw the world. We'll never get a job in Hollywood hanging with this guy. You can't act anyway, and it's not because you're black. No N-word will get the job. Keep the gaze down and don't look at any white man in his eyes. Pretend you don't know how to read, pretend you can't think, and pretend you don't look at white women. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that. Man, I don't, I'm not, I don't play.
Okay, your servant, no pimp, player, crook, gangster, a scoundrel. I play angry black man. I play a real one. When after tipping points, the dust settled, we find the same things that tore us apart would be the things that keep us all meddled and temper the journey that I'll embark. We move past our collective consciousness through acts that unite our humanity. Protections for our truths and perspectives give way to engagements of empathy. As history rendezvous with these points, it waters flowers that grow without rain to drown the differences that would exploit for self-love never bloom without some pain. Sometimes tipping points are just what we need to organize this in life's symmetry. <laughs> How's your COVID experience? <laughs> it's what they asked me. Nothing new to my existence. I'm always fighting to get free. The world's going crazy on this lockdown. <laughs> Welcome to my everyday life. Knowing I deserve a crown, but instead, born in strife. <laughs> now you all can relate <laughs> to my incarceration, but on a non-systemic scale. You're all on a temporary bad vacation, yet experiencing a prisoner's Daily hell. The world to move on with its vaccine. I just hope they remember us, incarcerated human beings. Clown! Clown! Sit down and frown. Get up, do nothing. Sit back down, cover your eyes, open your mouth. Go outside and spread it around. Clown, clown, where are you now? I wish you would listen to the first shutdown. Everyone has a favorite food, whether hot or cold. Mine is of the hot and forbidden kind. <laughs> Lechon, they call it. A staple of celebration on an island so small called Puerto Rico. Slow roasted pig cooked over a fire pit for 12 hours, stuffed with vegetables, smothered in delicate spices, beyond compare, a celebration upon itself. So soft that no chewing is required. So delicious that it needs no additions. Yes, it is only made in celebration, but that's okay. Every day is a celebration upon itself. So go ahead, seek it out, but it cannot be found, but rather, the smell of lechon finds you. A silent killer is drawing near, filling hearts and minds with fear. So wear your mask and wash your hands. It's spreading all across the land. But it's only a few hundred thousand lives and convenience requires a sacrifice. But it's the sick and the old they can't afford. But for the rich, what's a few trillion more? Turn on the news, see what's in store. It's back and forth with threats of war. They're holding a man down with a knee in his back. 
They think it won't matter because his skin is black. But now he's saying that he cannot breathe while the whole world watches in disbelief. He cries out for his mother with his final breath. Can we only see the value of life through death? Wait, here comes a man with a Bible in his hand. But dominance and violence is what he commands. Apparently, he doesn't understand the ills and the woes of the common man. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see what's in store for the land of the free. COVID, the invisible, can make you miserable. Mask it. Mask it. Or it takes you out. Tony, I know you share the story a lot, right? And it's it's an interesting story. But for the people who haven't uh, really heard it, um, how did you get involved with Marin Shakespeare Company? I, uh, I'm mall. Uh, Leslie knows Jamal. So Jamal hooked me up with Leslie. I mean, this is kind of like one of them, hey, homie, I know somebody type of things, right? And um, so uh, I talked to Soraya and she invited me to come down and I came down and I ain't stopped, I ain't stopped showing up, man. That was like uh, five years ago, you know? And uh, yeah, man, in the in the beginning of the return citizens, I was there. Right, you were there. I what was, was it, there. What What was it like uh, uh, coming into return citizens? I mean, did you have a vision of building something, or did somebody else have a vision, well, or did it just uh, eventually become this and maybe morph into something else? Um. So at the time. I was just starting to get into performances because when I left the when I left prison, there was no uh, Leslie hadn't showed up to Solano, and so I didn't I didn't uh, take advantage while I was in the joint. It wasn't there, you know. So uh, going and going to that first meeting with uh, Soraya. And I'm seeing all the people there, and I'm like, "Wow, man! You, did you when you get out, man?" And it it turned into a <laughs> like I didn't know you was home thing, man. And 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 some of these performers like uh, Zoe, uh, who you saw, I mean, he just like blew me away. I didn't see that on the yard, man. I didn't see that <laughs> by him. You know what I'm saying? I didn't see that. And and then I went to see Damien perform at. Uh, at Marin on stage, on that big stage, man. And I was like, wow, man, these dudes are like blowing me away, man. And I said, yeah, I can do this. And I've been, you know, I've been hanging out ever since, man. I've been hanging yeah. out ever since. I like to say, man, yeah, you can do this, right? <laughs> like, I, I believe what you believe. <laughs> uh, <It's>, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you, uh, I think we have a unique experience when dealing with incarcerated people's writings and reading them. Um, you know, when you started working with these creative writing from the inside, like when you started reading them and, and developing a voice for it, um, what was that experience like? Well, you know, it was um, reading uh, La John Hutchinson's uh eight minutes and 46 seconds being that i was used to doing like this one little style of performing that can that made me want to branch out and you know here's somebody else's words i'm gonna learn and i'm gonna in, incarnate I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be this person you know and man what a what a what a what a change it was it had me looking at the whole you know, uh, in the beginning, I mean, he was right on point in the beginning with uh, 
you know, Floyd and uh, John, uh, George Floyd and Brianna, you know, he was right on point and that's where everybody was. And I, I was feeling that at the time myself. So yeah, his writings and everything were right on time, man. And it was, it, you know, I mixed myself with him and yeah, that became a cool piece and I love that piece. You know? Yeah, that's a great piece, man. That's, I've read that a few times. I was like, man, that, that one, yeah. it really hit, hit some things, hit some points. Carlos, what was it like for you performing pieces written by people who were still inside when you were out, recently out? Uh, I'll say it kept me connected with the community that I had been part of for over half my life. Uh, you know, I've been incarcerated since I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's a weird experience. Um, if, imagine if one day you were told you had to leave a place that you wanted to leave, but in leaving that place, you had to leave everybody uh -huh. that has been through amazing things with you that has helped you through some of the most difficult times has been in a war with you that has helped you not die. Uh -huh. And told you can't, I can never have contact with them. I can never, unless it's already approved type stuff. Um, their humanity doesn't count. Our humanity doesn't count. Our human connection doesn't count once I leave that, that, that cage. Uh, and so doing these pieces, it was like sitting with them in that room or walking the yard with them or doing something and allow me to bring them out with me and present them to everybody that I could. Exactly. Um, incarceration is, is a, a hard experience. Um, you know, there's something that I think about, you know, like, um, is what we do helping people to realize what incarceration is like. Like these performances we do, can people really get the gravity of what incarceration does to a human being? And that people are incarcerated, human beings are incarcerated, you know? And I, I hope that this, you know, let, helps people to understand that we are not the sum of our crime and some of us um, are not criminals. We've been incriminated. We've been put in a less privileged, uh, marginalized place and told to do whatever we can to stay alive or, or to stay okay as long as I don't cross the street on the other side. I can do it in my community all day to a certain point. Then they bring that back once I get some understanding. But um, I really hope that like what I bring also with this is not only people's voice but understanding that there are fathers, there are mothers, there are sons, daughters, children, grandchildren imprisoned. We aren't just numbers. That there are people who have been through so much trauma in their life that instead of helping them deal with that trauma through programs like this, through mental health, they cage them. And if we could heal that trauma, the cages aren't necessary. Then the community becomes whole again because each one of them also is an asset to their community, their doctors, their mechanics, their fathers, their mothers, their aunts, uncles, their, their you know, their healers. All these different things are caged up behind not only a, a steel cage, but also a cage of trauma. 
and um, we have to change that. And I and like when I do these pieces, I want people to understand. Like Ray Ray's man, like he's sitting in a place wondering if his parents are okay. He doesn't care that he's locked up. He cares that he can't help his family because he's locked up. There's a difference there, a little subtle one, you know, or the guy saying, you know, I've heard this. Oh, I've been on lockdown with COVID. I, I know what it's like for, for you now. And I, I always want to give pushback on that because do you have to get naked on call in front of somebody? You know, do you have to worry that if I do not show up in a place, they write on a piece of paper that I never get out of prison. And what I mean by that is if I show, if I'm not in the place I'm supposed to be, if I am out of bounds, an officer can easily write, uh, it's called uh, uh, RVR, Rules Violation Report, or what we call a 115. And simply by standing on the wrong side of the line, this rules violation can, can put me in a predicament where I could spend five more years in prison, seven more years in prison if I'm a life parole inmate, as they say. And so I always push back like, yeah, you, a person still has that choice to walk out their front door to get in their car and to leave. COVID did not lock a person up. A person locked themselves away from a community. You know, whereas some of us, no matter the amount of healing we get, are unable to walk past the wall. And so that's why I always give pushback on that. Um, it may be hard to understand, but nobody relates to our experiences except for those who have been through our experiences. It is something that is, um, I wish nobody has to do. I don't want anybody to experience it, but nobody can really empathize with it because it's such a, a traumatic experience that, that you ha a person has to walk through. Did you see this when you was incarcerated? Did you see your life like it is right now? Or did you, huh. imagine, did you ever imagine having a life like you have right now? When I was first incarcerated, fuck no. All right. I was all about this. All right. And but so, as I sat back and I began to dream, because I always thought, you know, like, I don't know if you were raised like this, but I was raised where going to the joint was like, or, or getting locked up or being on probation was um, something to be. Oh, yeah. Um, it, yeah, it, it, it's a rite of passage, I think, yeah. in, all, in all thuggery ass communities. I think <laughs> it's a, a rite of passage that you get some form of, you know, locked up, being locked up, got to get, you got to get that shit validated by somebody. All right. But did you, has there ever been a time? that you, since you've been home, that you haven't thought about prison. I like some form of it, like something on a daily that reminds you of like, fuck, man, damn. Tony, look how fucked up I was, all right? Around 3.30, 4 o'clock, I would start to get nervous at work. I start putting the tools up. And my boss like, we ain't done yet. I'm like, I know. He's like, why are you putting things up? And I kept doing this for like two weeks. Couldn't figure out why. And I'm sitting there going, man, what? I, I like to work. I figured it out. I had done count for so many years that the anxiety of not being counted was making me do these things that I would do in order to be the place where I had to be. Now, with that, yes. Every day there's something that reminds me of prison. You know, last night I had a nightmare that I was locked up again. 
Yeah, I was sitting there like, hold on a minute. I thought I was free. What the hell's going on? I woke up and I was like, I had to walk around my apartment and touch things to make sure they were real. Yeah, I, I recently, I asked this question, bro, because I recently did a piece. And, uh, and it's about basically how COVID has been like a reminder, all of COVID has been like a reminder that, you know, lockdown to me, you know, it's kind of like all this shit that everybody's running around saying, ah, ah, about, I was already practicing in the joint, right? <laughs> I was already practicing social distancing. Give me my six, what the motherfucker say on the prison yard? Give me six feet, homie. Yeah. Give me six feet. Give me six feet. Back away from it. You was already saying that. If you was in dorm living, what did you do? You ran around with what? A spray bottle. Why? Because you would spray everything, right? So you was already and shit, right? And then what really like, I don't know, man. I think what really like hit home for me was like going, I went to the grocery store and I saw that long ass line. I saw the long line of people getting into the grocery store. I was instantly, instantly brought back to a prison yard. I was seeing men waiting to get into the canteen. You feel me? So, you know, my first, my first two weeks out, my wife and I were taking a walk. I mean, this was like, you know, 10 years ago now. Like my first two weeks out though, taking a walk, feet hit some gravel. Everything's cool, gravel sound. If you walk on any prison yard, you're gonna hear gravel, right? Yeah. You get a runner coming up on the side of you. What is he gonna say? To your left, to your right. I had a dude walk running up behind me. He didn't say nothing. I turned around with the quickness and ready to fight. So I knew I had some form of some kind of prison trauma to traumatizing shit going on. I went into a check cashing spot, an alarm went off, I dove on the ground. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, let me ask you this, Tony. Keys. Bro, I make my own keys jingle. You know why? I walk through the hallways of my job, my keys are jingling. You know why? That tells me I'm free. Ain't nobody got the key but me. I'm locking doors. I'm unlocking shit now. You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> it's my keys that are jingling. <laughs> so, yeah. So, understand. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, man. There's a lot of you know, my, and yeah, there's a whole lot of prison in the world, man, that I see. There's a whole lot of reminders. Can, you know, uh, uh, in the joint, everything we say has double meaning, triple meaning. Everything. Right? Right. And it's usually the person closest to you, the one that you got mad love for, is the one that's gonna break your heart the most, right? To put it lightly. Mm -hmm. um, did you have trouble forming relationships when you got out because of that mindset? You know, no, uh, for real, for real. That was, that was one of the things the governor used to hold me in prison, bro. Um, being that I'm from Los Angeles, my wife is, she's been established in the Bay Area for over, at that time, it was still over uh, 30 years that she had been living in the Bay Area. And so a lot of her friends became my friends through writings and everything like that. So they wrote letters in saying, you know, yeah, we, we would support and, you know, nurture Tony's, you know, transformation back into society, you know. Yeah, he said, nah, man. He said, you would have a hard time making friends. But he didn't know me very well because I am a people person, man. Don't let this, you know, gruff look fool. <laughs> um, but yeah, he used that against me. And no, that's never been a problem for me, man. Not even in the, not even on the yard, bro. I, I would, I crossed all barriers, even though I was like, you know, supposed to be in a section of, 
like little gangster crip dudes. I posed to be in a section. I had, uh, you know, that little cutout spot on the prison yard. This is our side. And I was supposed to be over there. I was supposed to be over there. Mm -mm. You can find me over there with some with some Southerners talking business about, man, y'all got some, you gonna cook some food. I'm gonna need some of that. Yeah, you can find me talking to some skinhead dudes. You can find me talking to any and everybody on a prison yard, man. I had no problems with that. But I knew there was a line that couldn't be crossed as well. And we all had that mutual understanding. But yeah, man, people, I love people. We need people, man. That's why COVID was so hard, man. Yeah. Got, you know, we got shut off from people, man. We're human. We need contact. Yeah, just... Yeah, does anybody in the audience have a question? <laughs> I guess the only question I have is what now that you are returned citizens, what helps to sustain your writing? For for me, being able, you know, um, because I, I, I tend to think I'm funny. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Thank you. Um I uh I like telling my stories more humorous. I, I you know I I know you know it I mean it was a lot of hard stuff in prison, man. You know, not just in prison, but in CYA. I did two tours of CYA, county camp, you know, and I mean I was taken away for stints at a time. I mean, you know, my whole young life had been incarcerated. So just, you know, now sitting back and looking at, you know, a lot of the things, hell man, people still need to know this is what a system was doing to a young mind. And CYA, you know? for those who don't know, is California Youth Authority. Yeah, California, excuse me, California Youth Authority, CYA, and uh, county camp of, uh, uh, one of Los Angeles county camps. They had many, Los Angeles had many county camps to send juveniles to. So I wanted to just mention a, a couple of links that I'm gonna put in the chat. Um, the, you all mentioned Canteen and, um, uh, let me see, that link didn't, Canteen, um, many people in prison, um, Canteen is so important because it gives very, very important, very important, additional food and toiletries and other resources. And we are supporting a project um, uh, that Restore Justice is doing called the Canteen Project. I just put the link in the in the chat. If you enjoyed being here tonight and you'd like to make a contribution to something, please um, consider contributing to the Canteen Project. It, it gets funds directly into the hands of people who are incarcerated to help make their lives a little more bearable. And the other link that I just wanted to share with you all. Um, we've been going back into San Quentin now for three weeks, and I um, have written up some um, impressions and conversations that we've had with um, the men inside. Um, so if you're interested in, in hearing more about, particularly at San Quentin, what the pandemic has been like, you can, and what it's like starting programs up again, you can Read my blog. <laughs> Thank you, Carlos and Tony. You guys are amazing, and your work is incredible. And I'll and I'll tell everybody we are in production for our second creative writing from inside. So sometime soon there'll be another video to share, and we hope to continue to have more conversations like this for a very long time. Thank you again for being here tonight. <laughs>